friends, mentees, colleagues, collaborators, even former students. My name is Carol Brown, and I am pleased to moderate our Best Shrift Symposium honoring Professor Daniel Mendelker. We gather today more than 150 registrants strong for a single purpose. We gather to mark and to celebrate Professor Mendelker's many accomplishments in advancing the study of property law, land use planning, law and litigation, environmental law, state and local government law, and constitutional law. More specifically, top of mind is Professor Mendelker's most recent article published last year entitled Billboards, Signs, Free Speech, and the First Amendment. I am joined by distinguished speakers and commentators who will share professional insights and heartfelt remarks this afternoon about Professor Mandelker. The speakers and commentators' impressive biographies can be found in the program and the extended version of the speaker's remarks will be published in The Urban Lawyer. As you can observe from the printed program, the volume of scholars and practitioners who wish to celebrate Professor Mendelker's stellar career is quite large, so much so that we determined the best approach would be to publish the speaker's full remarks and make them available online in lieu of carving away time for responses, questions, and comments during the best shift. Let us keep our friends and colleagues who are in the pathway of Hurricane Ian in our thoughts and prayers this afternoon. In fact, a few of our program participants are located in Florida and should their participation be interrupted for power outages or any other reason, we will move to the next participant on the program while we work behind the scenes to reestablish their connection either via Zoom or by telephone. And a final note with regard to our program, Amy Mandelker and David Callies are unable to join us today due to unavoidable conflicts. They send their sincere regrets and their very best wishes to Professor Mandelker. As, as Mrs. Booker just made us aware, we have a surprise this afternoon. Uh, Russell K. Osgood, Dean of Washington University School of Law has joined us and would like to make a few remarks. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, welcome everybody and thank you uh, for coming here. But most of all, I'm here to honor Dan, uh, who uh, we believe is the longest serving faculty member in the history of the law school. Am I correct about that, Dan? Unmute okay. yourself, Dan. Right, and um, he was a fantastic faculty member here at the law school for a very long period of time. He rendered great service to the bench and to the bar and to his students here at the law school particularly those interested in land use and the other fields that Dan was interested in. <clears throat> and we also had a long relationship of him stimulating other scholars and other schools and practitioners that today we honor. I also want to thank the staff who worked with Dan on this. As any of you know, um, Dan is a detailed person. And so details uh, uh, have to be conveyed to the people who work on it. So I want to thank Gail Boker and Billy Gutierrez uh, for working with Dan. Uh, Dan is always uh, easy to work with, um, and you will be in frequent communication with Dan if you're working with him. So thank you all. But let me just end by honoring Dan and thanking him for his long service and also thanking him for helping us to arrange this event to honor him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean. Before I turn to our speakers, please indulge me for a moment as I share a bit of Professor Mendelker's influence on my career and professional happiness. 
what is a North Star? The North Star is the anchor of the Northern sky. It's a landmark, it's a marker. It helps those who follow it determine direction as it glows brightly to guide and to lead toward a purposeful destination. Symbolically, the North Star depicts a beacon of inspiration and hope to many. That is what Professor Mandelker has been to me, a North Star. I credit him for much of what professional success I have achieved. Professor Mendelker has provided guidance and direction on my journey. I first met Professor Mendelker in 2002. I was still a new law professor in my second year. I had the good fortune of having chosen his land use planning and control casebook for my land use class. I could not have known then that years later, I would have the honor of joining the casebook as an author. But in 2002, I did know that my land use casebook seemed to be the only casebook I had chosen that was actually working out for me. Students liked the casebook, I liked the casebook, and I loved the teacher's manual. And I also deeply appreciated Professor Mendelker's generosity in answering a young professor's questions, sometimes on the eve of class and probably always with a little sense of panic lingering behind the words. Over the years and before obtaining tenure even, I changed all of my case books for all of my classes at least once. That is for all of my classes except for land use. I've had the pleasure of teaching from Professor Mendelker's casebook for my entire career. After all of these years, I still pepper him with questions, though hopefully the sense of panic is gone and as well the sense of urgency. And after all these years, he still answers. Professor Mendelker has influenced my scholarship just as much as he has my teaching. My first Law Review article was a regulatory takings piece and it was greatly informed and influenced by Professor Mendelker's work. I was honored when Professor Mendelker invited me to join his casebook. The exposure he provided me and the confidence he showed in me changed the trajectory of my career and brought me into a wonderful relationship with my co-authors, two of whom will be speaking later, Nancy Stroud and Dwight Miriam. I am deeply grateful to Professor Mendelker and look forward to more years of collaborating and sharing our mutual passion of land use and planning law. In conclusion, if you have a North Star in your career, you are fortunate indeed. I have had one in my career, Professor Mandelker, and having a professional relationship with him has made all the difference. It's now my pleasure to turn to our speakers, the first of which is Brian J. Conley. Uh, thank you, Carol, uh, and good afternoon, and, and thank you um, being a part of this fast shrift, uh, which is a term that I had to look up when I was invited, uh, and more importantly, being a part of this community of land use planners and lawyers with Professor Mandelker uh, is truly an incredible honor. Um, in the small field of land use law, there seems to be a long tradition of overlap between the practical and the academic. Uh, there may be mer myriad reasons for the overlap, but I would probably attribute it to the fact that every person in every place experiences the built environment, and thus in land use law, uh, the academic is the practical. Um, and I think Professor Mandelker embodies that overlap, having been one of the leading academic thinkers and teachers in this field for many decades, uh, while also understanding and appreciating the real world consequences of the law. Um, so given Professor Mandelker's interests and contributions in the area of First Amendment application to land use law and our work together on this topic, uh, the article that I've prepared uh, for this special shift will focus on the most recent development in, in the thorny area of sign and advertising regulation uh, stemming from the Supreme Court's decision in City of Austin versus Reagan National Advertising. Uh, the court's decision in Reagan was remarkably practical in its application of complex First Amendment doctrine, and so whether or not the justices knew 
that Professor Mandelker was retiring, they provided a fitting send off for him, uh, bridging the academic and practical in a decision that will impact the daily lives of every American and the way that each of us experiences the built environment, namely in the way that we receive communication through outdoor signage. So what are the lessons from Reagan and what are the questions that follow the case? Well, the most immediate lesson, which cements Professor Mandelker's in many of our collective teaching, is that local governments can indeed regulate billboards. Uh, the longstanding distinction between on-premises and off-premises signs uh, is now content neutral and therefore will not attract strict scrutiny. And local governments can continue to apply the lessons taught by Professor Mandelker and others and can continue to restrict off-premises advertising, ensuring safe, economically vibrant, and aesthetically attractive communities. And more importantly, we no longer need to review the five confusing opinions of Metro Media to glean this information. Uh, we now have a six justice majority that's told us that it's the law. There are other lessons, however, for lawyers, planners, and all of us. Uh, and I see five key takeaways from the case. First, the court's focus on the on-premises, off-premises distinction uh, was oriented toward the locational aspect of signs, which superseded any concern that the court had that the distinction might lead to improper content discrimination. This is a departure from the dogmatic approach that was taken in Reed versus Town of Gilbert and other recent decisions, and at least suggests that the court has landed on an approach to content neutrality that still requires strict adherence to facial and functional neutrality, but at least recognizes that where a distinction is not centrally about content, there might be room for some functional departures from the doctrinaire approach of Reed. The second lesson is that the court didn't abandon Reed. Local governments regulating non-commercial signs that are not billboards must still adhere to the strictures of Reed. Uh, and although pivoting to the Reed approach to sign regulation has provoked some pain in municipal halls across the country, uh, thanks in part to the teaching of Professor Mandelker, local governments have integrated facial content neutrality into their sign regulations in a workable way. The third lesson is that the Reagan decision calls into question the premature conclusion that the court may be looking to abandon the commercial speech doctrine. The commercial and non-commercial distinction and the on-premises, off-premises distinction are intricately intertwined due to the fact that the locational distinction also requires local governments to ensure that they are not favoring commercial speech over non-commercial speech. And the court's endorsement of the locational distinction suggests that it may also be comfortable with the commercial, non-commercial distinction. The fourth lesson is that although the decision does not decide the question of whether the underlying regulation meets intermediate scrutiny, by placing the on-premises off-premises distinction in that category, the decision seems to invite local governments to continue to regulate signs on the basis of traffic safety and aesthetics. And the final takeaway is that Reagan is a remarkably practical decision from the court, and I think that was guided by good lawyering. Um, in an era of Supreme Court jurisprudence that whether it's measured by polling data or practical application appears disconnected from a lot of practical things. The Reagan decision reflects a court that appeared not to want to upset over a hundred years worth of regulation uh, and was also sensitive to the real life safety, economic and environmental impacts of signs. Uh, and this recognition I think is a testament to the power of good advocacy on the city's part and on the part of Amiki who made the justices, all of whom commute to work and experience the built environment just as the rest of us do uh, understand the practical implications of a decision that would have otherwise undermined the status quo had it gone another way. So what questions are we left with after Reagan? I think three in particular stand out. First, how will the courts continue to evaluate sign regulations under intermediate scrutiny? We've had recent decisions from the Supreme Court and federal appellate courts suggesting that the leeway afforded to the government in these cases is tightening and the evidentiary standards seem in flux and this will be an area for further clarification. Second, what are some of the areas of sign regulation where the court might be inclined to take an approach similar to its decision in Reagan? Courts of appeals have wrestled with the practicalities of things like event-based signage, uh, for example, whether the government can require their removal after the event occurs in other areas. And so which of these might be susceptible to a Reagan-like functionality test as time passes on uh, will be something to watch. And then third, uh, is Reagan just a blip on the radar screen? Since the Reed decision, the court has been on a long march toward a bright line rule regarding content neutrality, uh, and this de decision appears to be a departure from that rule. Uh, so as I conclude, I would like to thank you again for having me today, uh, Dan, and particularly to you, and thank you to you, Dan, for the path that you've made for all of us who are here today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brian. We look forward to reading 
the full article and it is published again in the in the Urban Lawyer in the online editions. Very interesting work and dovetails nicely with Professor Mandel Perez's uh, recent article. Uh, I think looking for some amendment issues. Thank you. Next, we have Lee Einsweiler. Thank you, Carol. Um, my name is Lee Einsweiler. I'm a founding principal at a planning firm called Code Studio. I uh, have to confess I'm not an attorney, which probably makes Dan unhappy. He probably might have rather I had gotten my law degree. But uh, I met Dan many, many years ago through my father, Robert Einsweiler, who was also a planner before me. And in fact, I often call myself a third generation planner. My grandfather was a mayor in a small town in Illinois and uh, served therefore as the chief planner of the community. Um, my father and Dan probably met in the early 70s. Uh, my dad worked a lot, especially with ULI on land use issues at that point in time. And uh, so Dan has already uh, sort of uh, been around. Um, he was also luckily a favorite of my mother's, which uh, allowed my parents to connect with him in Florida periodically uh, as they aged. And uh, uh, Dan has uh, outlived them both, I'm afraid, uh, but Dan, you'll be happy to know we uh, scattered dad's ashes in Northern Minnesota just this last weekend. Um, Dan is a, an amazing human being in that uh, at the age that he's at, he continues to reach and stretch and learn. And uh, that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, many people at his stage would be uh, propped up feeding French fries to the seagulls, and uh, that's not Dan's model. Um, he uh, recently reached out to me on, on current trends in zoning. We've had uh, several lively conversations about that. Uh, he's prepared a, a, a recent paper on mixed use zoning. It's uh, uh, coming out sometime soon, um, uh, and uh, he allowed me to contribute some some ideas to that uh, based on some of the work that that we've conducted. So uh, I find him um, not only to be a, a fabulous mentor uh, and uh, uh, attorney, but also a, a companion in this march towards better zoning across the country. Um, I. Uh, am in the process of writing a piece on improving land use equity. And my particular focus is on uh, zoning issues and land use equity. Um, as many know, recently we've been hearing an awful lot about this uh, redlining and uh, zoning, its companion partner, have uh, reduced land use equity over time, uh, increased the differential in both racial and income inequality, um, the color of law does a great job of, of explaining the redlining portion. Um, there are others writing about this issue, especially in the wake of uh, the George Floyd death in Minneapolis. Um, many of the maps and uh, many of the implications of those patterns seem to be entrenched still today. Uh, and other laws and policies have come together uh, to, to make sure that those patterns stay in place, whether that's freeway location, uh, federal lending practice, uh, they have all worked to um, make it harder and harder to see land use equity in the patterns of our zoning across the country. So to improve, it is uh, uh, absolutely necessary to uh, alter those inequitable land use patterns. And if we want those patterns not to continue, we've got to be fairly radical in rethinking, especially single family zoning. Um, this requires in our minds a, a, a step of analysis of, of land use and historic patterns in each of our communities. Uh, it requires some new thinking about land use policy. Uh, there are some groundbreakers uh, uh, ahead of us. Um, Minneapolis has done a great job, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, and of course, Seattle and Portland, as always on the bleeding edge. But the fact of the matter is what we really need the most are some examples of good land use regulation 
and actually uh, some, uh, some rethinking of both zoning and subdivision. And so I wanna uh, talk briefly uh, uh, about a, a project that we're working on in Charlottesville, uh, North Carolina, eh, sorry, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, uh, I just visited there last evening and we got uh, Council and Planning Commission's joint blessing to move forward with some fairly radical ideas that show up on their future land use map. For those of you who might be curious uh, in advance of the article coming out, if you look at the Seville Plans Together.com website, uh, you can find some of this or just look up uh, Charlottesville and new zoning and you'll probably find it as well. In the future land use map that was adopted by council, uh, there was a requirement that allows for all of the single family areas that are previously designated in the city to allow for three new residential units. And if you retain the main house, you can keep that as well. So up to four units per lot in the existing city. In addition, one of the key things is that many of those lots can still be subdivided into multiple lots. So today, where in some of the uh, higher income and more segregated portions of the community, you might find lots over an acre, you may well be able to split those up into uh, uh, multiple lots, each of which would receive an allocation of rights equal to, to three to four units per acre, depending on whether there was an existing house preserved on the site. So this is a model um, not dissimilar to some of the other things being done in, in some of the other communities that have gone before us, but uh, for someone uh, with a land area of 10 and a half square miles to commit to a process like this has been fairly amazing. We are replacing a wide variety of separate single family districts, about six of them, with a single district. It'll be replaced with a single minimum lot size and the allocation of rights across the entire thing will be exactly the same. Over time, our hope is that this will generate more opportunities for people to live in neighborhoods that they never had access to before, based on the addition of new smaller units in rear yards and side yards, or breaking up uh, larger buildings to accommodate them uh, in any way possible, achieving more housing within the city. We are also working on a quite radical proposal uh, for affordable housing, which actually in that same area that allows four units is going to allow three times that many units, provided they are all affordable and will actually provide an incentive in uh, bulk and lot coverage uh, to produce those affordable units. And they are proposed to be affordable, not at 80% AMI, which is where many people can actually serve the open marketplace, but actually at 50 or perhaps 60% AMI, down where real help is needed in order for people uh, uh, to produce housing. So it's a very uh, interesting project. It's a very enormous challenge all across the United States to consider replacing a core portion of our zoning with some of these new ideas, but I think that it is absolutely necessary if we truly believe in the provision of future land use equity in these places. And I thank Dan for making sure that there would be a path forward for some of these ideas, and I look forward to his help in promoting these ideas, uh, even as he uh, moves forward in his other work in land use law. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lee. So I sense that you and I both are going to keep Professor Mandelker working in his retirement. I appreciate your, your bridging Professor Mandelker's important work with, with thorough comprehensive planning and equity issues. And I, I know in our casebook, his casebook, we do a, he does a lot of excellent work thinking about housing issues, affordability issues. Uh, I, I think your reference to the color of law is so important and other scholars are also really focusing on these equity issues, especially at this time. I think about uh, Sanders et al's work on um, uh, in, in the book, Moving Toward Integration as in, 
important in this area as well. So thank you for, for highlighting Professor Mandelker's, again, continuing work around issues of equity, inclusionary zoning, and, um, and thorough uh, comprehensive planning. Thank you. Next, Ed Sullivan. All right, I'm unmuted. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Sullivan. Um, I practiced uh, law, mostly planning law, for 45 years. I've been teaching planning law for 51 years, and I've had a long and productive uh, association with uh, Professor Mandelker as a correspondent, as a mentor, and as a friend. Um, I uh, started using his textbook in the fifth edition. Uh, I'm now a co author. Uh, on the 10th the edition. Uh, and uh, again, this has been a, a, a love of uh, uh, the profession and a love of, uh, of planning law that uh, we both share. For both Professor Mandelker and myself, uh, a central uh, feature of our academic life has been the primacy of the comprehensive plan. Uh, this builds on the work of Charles Haar from 1955 uh, it uh, builds on the groundbreaking work of Professor Mandelker in his 1976 Law Review article, The Role of the Comprehensive Plan in Land Use Regulation. And it was the inspiration for uh, 25 years of uh, my work in surveying the relationship of the comprehensive plan with land use regulations and actions uh, for the American Bar Association. Uh, finally, Dan and I worked on a, uh, a APA ABA collaboration on uh, uh, how comprehensive planning should be done and how judicial and administrative review should occur. It's only fitting that a festschrift honoring the long and influential career of this great academic includes some thoughts on Professor Mandelker's contributions on the planning process, particularly with regard to plan formulation, the role of the plan and its relationship to land use regulations and actions, and in the administrative and judicial review of land use actions with the plan in mind. <coughs> My own small contribution to this best script includes some thoughts on the role of the comprehensive plan in Oregon over the last 50 years, a role that is deeply inspired by the work of Professor Mandelker. Some background, Oregon allowed cities to undertake planning and zoning in 1919 un, uh, under a requirement that zoning be in accordance with a well-considered plan. In 1947 and revised in 1963, it allowed counties to undertake uh, planning and zoning, but directly said that there were two different documents out there. Uh, one for planning and one for land use regulation, which is a distinction that is not made generally across the country. In 1969, the Oregon legislature required all cities and counties to undertake planning and zoning for all the non-federal lands within their jurisdiction. It failed mainly because there wasn't uh, money and there wasn't the uh, political oomph to get it done. But in 1973, the Oregon legislature passed Senate Bill 100, which among other things required uh, the establishment of a new land use planning agency, a state agency that would adopt policies that were binding on local plans and therefore on local regulations uh, and uh, provided a mechanism for review of local plans to assure that state policy as embodied in these uh, uh, adopted uh, LCDC policies uh, would be uh, carried out. The most far ranging of the 19 goals that were adopted was goal two, land use plan, which deals with the planning process and has three elements. One, the planning process itself. How do plans get put together? How are they reviewed? How are they adopted? And what force they have? Secondly, how to deal with exceptions. Those uh, areas in which you can't get from here to there and meet the goals and providing for this sort of variance process. And thirdly, the use of something called guidelines, which are best practices for meeting the various goals. 
Let me start with the planning process itself. Um, here we have a series of steps. Let me just mention them and then tell you a little bit about how these steps got into place. Uh, the planning process includes identification of issues and problems, inventories and other factual information for each of the goals, evaluation of alternative courses of action, ultimate policy choices, uh, considering various uh, consequences of taking any of them, supporting information uh, to back up factually and legally uh, the choices that are made, and then assuring that plans are adopted formally and are available for uh, people to review. My research indicates that this step-by-step -step approach was the feature of a newly reigning planning theory of the late 60s and the early 70s called the rational planning model, which was a reaction to the planning model which it supplanted, a model that focused upon concrete issues of public facilities and services and allocations of land uses to particular zones, but did not take into consideration many of the urban social realities that cities and urban areas found themselves in. This model was advanced by a noted planning academic F. Stuart Chapin, in the various uh, editions of his book that was very popular in the planning community at the time, and this is 1974, 1975, called Urban Land Use Planning, particularly the 1965 edition of this book, in which Chapin sought to apply the social sciences to plans and planning theory. And his book set out many of the steps that I've just outlined for you and found in goal two. The rational planning model was founded in an enlightenment logic and in the scientific method and is focused on experts and expertise. The model was subsequently criticized for largely omitting public participation and the social and political aspects of land use planning. Think of the controversy between Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs uh, over public works, planning and neighborhoods. Nevertheless, the, the rational planning model lives on in Oregon's goal too. Although Oregon also has strong aspirations for public participation in another binding statewide planning goal. Maybe then Oregon has the best of both worlds, planning policies supported by science and expertise and refined by the realities of public participation. The second part of uh, this goal deals with exceptions allowing deviance from state land use policies embodied in the goals in three limited circumstances. The first two relates to lands that have already been lawfully developed or physically committed to uses that were subsequently determined by uh, the adoption of the goals to be inconsistent with those policies. Think for example, of a rural subdivision outside an urban growth boundary, a use which the goals would not now allow. The developed exception treats the subdivision as a lawful non-conforming use. The committed exception applies to an area in which there has been physical commitments, perhaps in the form of uh, sewer or water lines, which have been lawfully laid, although no structures had yet been built, but treating those activities as a vested right. No more of these uses would be allowed now, and these exceptions were concessions to political and legal realities. But the last of these three exceptions would accommodate a need that could not otherwise be accommodated in a place or in a manner consistent with our state land use policies embodied in the goals, such as a dam and associated uh, staff housing in, in a rural area that was not connected with resource use, or the expansion of a rural land fill or golf course on uh, lands in uh, so certain soil categories. The exceptions process is just that. It's for an exceptional land use. They are tightly constrained, difficult to obtain, and even if granted and challenged, are often reversed on appeal. I should also note that the Oregon legislature has obviated the need for exceptions in some cases by allowing them directly by statute, such as uh, the widening of roads and the like. The third part of this goal deals with guidelines, which accompany each goal to set out best practices or considerations that should, but are not required, 
to be used in demonstrating compliance with a particular goal. Through statewide planning goal two, Oregon has established longstanding, 50 years almost, and binding expectations as to what state, regional, and local governments must do to carry out the 19 areas of state policy. The utility and relative clarity of the Oregon planning process under this goal stands as a monument to Professor Mandelker's thoughtful contributions to the art of planning. We are all indeed indebted to Professor Mandelker and his work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. Indeed, I think your, your, the breadth and depth of your expertise and appreciation of the complexities of the land use comprehensive plan is vested only by Professor Mandelkers. And I, I think we all see why he was indeed pleased when you accepted uh, the invitation to join the casebook. You are a phenomenal co-author and, and, and I know that we all agree that with you on board, uh, we are well situated. So thank you very much. And we also look forward to the fullness of your contributions in the Urban Lawyer publication. Finally, the last speaker, John M. Baker. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I'm an attorney. I moonlighted for a bit as a uh, law professor at one of the local law schools here in the Twin Cities area. And um, I'm one of the founders of a 20 person law firm in Minneapolis known as Green Espel. The first time I saw the name Dan Mandelker, it was one of the names of the authors on the case book that the late Joseph Sachs required us to buy in his land use law class at the University of Michigan in the 1980s. Um, I got to know Professor Dan Mandelker on a personal level when I fell into a role as one of a relatively small number of government side attorneys trying to beat the billboard companies and who were trying to reach the top of the steep learning curve of court decisions and legal doctrines that govern those disputes. We discovered that there was Bill Britton, the late Bill Britton down in um, Jacksonville, Florida, who was playing that role uh, very well. No one really understood the law. It seemed in the practice of it better than Bill. Randy Morrison out in San Diego as well was also useful. Um, my need to, to suddenly uh, get involved in this was because there was a very bright Harvard Law School grad in Atlanta who came up with the idea of surfing the internet now that city codes were generally available there and to find sign codes that were dusty ones that uh, hadn't been updated for a while to reflect the evolution of the restrictions, the First Amendment restrictions. And when he would find such a city or such a town or such a county, he'd start up a LLC billboard company from nothing. He would apply for to build the biggest billboards possible above and beyond the, the dimensional limitations of the ordinance and then try and strike down the ordinance uh, if it predictably wasn't approved based upon the uh, fact that there was a lack of content neutrality in various other parts of the sign code because it hadn't been updated. And then if he succeeded at that, he would offer to help the city or the county rewrite their sign code so that it would be constitutional with the consequence that the companies that he set out would then have a monopoly on massive billboards. So when we found ourselves in those defending my hometown uh, among others, I was told by, Dan, by uh, Bill Britton to reach out to Dan Dan offered sound and free advice to us. And then when we won at the district court and I needed to defend that in St. Louis at the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, Dan came along to watch the argument in that case and to provide us with further thoughts. Dan then invited me to pres present with him 
updates on sign law at annual conventions and conferences of the American Planning Association, where we've both been very active. Of course, I accepted and, and did so as often as my practice would permit. And he also reached out to me as still a relatively unknown newcomer at this intersection of land use law and the First Amendment to join his team of co-authors of Street Graphics and the Law, which is a continuously updating book that he had christened. And of course I accepted it. Um, and a lot of people in the, the, both lawyers and planners have got various versions of Street Graphics. The 1988 version, the one that uh, Dan and I and um, uh, Rick Crawford wrote more recently, um, now there are about four Dan Mandelkers that I'm grateful for having come to know. First, there's Dan, the generous co-author. Dan was generous about sharing the credit for co-presenting or co-authorizing, co-authoring with an unknown person like me. And what he cared the most about was keeping his work up to date and keeping it meaningful to readers and to listeners and to practitioners. Second, there's Dan the Taskmaster. Uh, the familiar model is that the most experienced teammates delegate the implementation of their vision to those of us who are less experienced. Dan reversed that model, particularly for our street graphics and the law update. Professor Mandelker was always our taskmaster setting and enforcing the deadlines. Our receptionists here at the law firm still remember needing to track me down in some meeting because Dan was concerned he wanted to make sure we were going to make the next deadline. And without Dan playing that role, I think that book still might be forthcoming today. Um, third, there's Dan, the even handed visionary. Sign law tends to be one of these subjects where advocates and some scholars consistently side with either the regulators or with the regulated. But Dan continually emphasized the need to foresee the weaknesses in certain kinds of laws and policies and to make those weaknesses an important focus of our teaching and writing. Um, at least since Dan was a co-author, Street Graphics and the Law has always had a model sign code in it. And thanks in large part to Dan, we were able to draft sign, that model sign code and then build real sign codes based upon that, that are more likely to, to survive a few changes in direction by the US Supreme Court and other courts. And one example, uh, when everybody else seemed to think that it was all about content neutrality, one of the points that Dan emphasized was this tension between the First Amendment's prohibition on unbridled discretion as applied to expressive conduct, which includes signs, and the traditional standards and approaches for land use law variances and conditional uses that were purposely broad and abstract and not very specific. And the danger that if a particular community treated, allowed for a variance of expressive conduct like a sign using the same standards that apply to all other conditional use permits or special use permits or variance applications that you were setting yourself up for a First Amendment violation because a court would look at that and say, that looks like unbridled discretion. And so we were worrying about that long before that became a increasingly important way for people to try and strike down sign codes. And hopefully we protected some cities by doing so. Now, I was an attorney who was accustomed to writing briefs, arguing that a local government had done no wrong so Dan's approach didn't really always come natural to me. But when I look back and I recognize that Dan's lesson was essential to my ability to alleve, achieve a counseling level beyond the litigation level. And last but not least, there's Dan, the role model. You know, With each passing year, 
there are fewer and fewer people around me as a 61 year old, I think, to follow as examples of where to go next with my life or with my career. For me, Dan Mandelker has set an example of how to live and how to remain sharp. Uh, I knew that when I'd have a chance to co-present with Dan at a conference that it could also include a chance for Dan and I to tour an art museum together if there was a good one in town. I'd have to, uh, I'd have the chance with Dan to observe Dan's drive in keeping doing what he loved and also doing that as long as his body would keep up with it, which it still has. <laughs> Um, that more than anyone else is uh, anything else is what I love and appreciate about being fortunate enough to get to know Dan Manbooker. So I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this marvelous setting, and I will, um, uh, consistent with the fifth Dan Mandelker, Dan the timekeeper, uh, let me please everybody by quitting short of my minimum period of maximum period of time of six minutes. Thank you so very much, John. As you spoke, I found myself laughing because I I concur with all of all all of your Dan Mandelkers. I have a great experience with them. Not so much the timekeeper, but the first four. And in my mind, Professor Mandelker, I can hear our conversations as we were working on each edition of the case book and your voice now carol and you would tell me something and you'd say you agree don't you do you agree with that and i'm thinking absolutely i agree i i don't know that i understand it all but i concur and i'd scurry away and look up whatever he whatever you uh, said to me and you'd always conclude the com the the call with an affirmation well i i know you have this in good hands carol and i was thinking well i'm I, it, well, I'm not sure that I do, but we will have it in good hands. And so that confidence that you expressed as you were encouraging, uh, teaching, pushing forward, you know, that bit of pressure, but always with a sense of confidence that I'm, I'm putting a lot on you and I have confidence you can do it. And it was, I will always hear your voice. Um, and, and I appreciate, um, I appreciate you so much. Well, I, I, I am confident that my all of the commentators and guests will concur when I say that we are all looking forward to the full written presentations of our speakers. Again, we, we have a, a brief taste of it now, but we all look forward to the written materials coming out in the Urban Lawyer. Uh, with that, we will turn to our first set of commentators and again, um, Amy Mandelker and uh, David Callie send their sincere uh, uh, regrets for being unable to participate, but their dearest uh, and, and uh, best wishes. So our first commentator is Robert L. Glicksman. Thanks, Thank Carol. You. I'm a professor of law at the George Washington University in DC. I'm delighted to be able to contribute to today's event, honoring Dan. More than 20 years ago, I was invited to participate in the first celebration of Dan's work. I wrote an article then about Dan's scholarship concerning the takings clause of the 5th and 14th Amendments. Today, I want to discuss my experiences working with Dan in a different area in which he's made his mark, his work on environmental law issues. I'll talk about our work together in three contexts, and what I don't have time to cover today, I'll include in my printed remarks in The Urban Lawyer. First, our casebook. I first met Dan in the early 1990s when Dan Tarlek invited me to join the environmental law casebook that the two of them and Fred Anderson had first published in the early 1980s, Environmental Protection, Law and Policy. Two editions of the book had been published. Dan T. asked me to become the coordinating co-author for the third edition, which was published in 1999. The ninth edition of the book is now in press with Aspen. The only co-author who participated in the third edition who is still on the book with me is Dan Mandelker. Dan's NEPA chapter is as up to date and fun to teach as ever. For example, this edition will highlight recent cases addressing whether NEPA requires agencies to consider the upstream and downstream effects on climate change 
of actions like approval of oil and gas production or natural gas pipeline construction. I can always rely on Dan. He never misses a deadline. He usually has his work done weeks, if not months ahead of time. Second, our treatise. Based on our work together on the casebook, Dan asked me in 2004 to take over preparation of a chapter in his iconic treatise, NEPA Law and Litigation, which was first published in 1984. I started off preparing annual updates to one chapter of the book. Dan has since relinquished control over five more chapters to me. I'm grateful that Dan sought me out to work on such a well-regarded book. When the book was first published, a lieutenant in the Naval Legal Service Office Detachment published a review. Let me quote to you from that review. Lieutenant Rosenberg remarked that commanding officers often call on judge advocates and law specialists for advice on environmental matters affecting their installation. When the resolution of the issue is governed by NEPA, Dan Mandlicker's book, NEPA Law and Litigation, is an excellent guide. He called NEPA Law and Litigation an invaluable and comprehensive treatment of the subject. He wrote that a key question to any military legal advisor is what command actions may trigger the requirement for an environmental impact statement. The treatise can assist in command planning because it provides extensive case analysis of when an impact statement is necessary for activities like base closings, flight patterns, waste removal, and other military operations. Rosenberg concluded that NEPA law and litigation is therefore highly recommended for judge advocates and law specialists dealing with the environmental consequences of military activities. So in short, Dan's NEPA treatise has been essential to the preservation of our national defense for more than 40 years. Others have heaped praise on Dan's other NEPA projects. Former students of both me and Dan have told us that the treatise is an essential resource for anybody who practices NEPA, NEPA law and litigation. A former student of mine who practices in that area wrote to me that, out of all the treatises and practitioner guides I have read, NEPA law and litigation is by far the best written and most useful. Additional proof of the treatise's value lies in its citation counts. The Supreme Court cited NEPA law and litigation twice, in both the 1989 Metho Valley case and the 2010 Geertsen Seed Farms case. Courts, including two state courts, have cited the book in 28 other cases. Scholars cited the book in about 250 law review articles, proving that the treatise is an essential aid to judges and scholars alike. And Dan still, to this day, screens all the cases for all chapters of the book, setting up the work of those of us who uh, join him in publication of the book. Finally, the classroom. Before Dan retired from teaching, I had the pleasure of joining his environmental law seminar when he covered the Endangered Species Act. Before that, I'd never had the opportunity to see him teach. Not surprisingly, I was impressed with the class sessions. Dan's selection of reading materials both provided needed background information about the Endangered Species Act and set the stage for discussion of critical conservation policy issues and unsettled legal questions. The classes were marked by lively discussion, which was expertly moderated by Dan. He piggybacked on my presentation to challenge students to think critically about the Endangered Species Act as he had done. These sessions convinced me that Dan's students benefited from both his environmental law research and his talent as a teacher. I'll conclude by saying that I will always cherish my collaborations with Dan, both in print and in the classroom. And thanks for allowing me to participate. Excuse me, I apologize. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for sharing the, the high regard and esteem with which Professor Mendelker's work is held by practitioners, advocates, and subject matter experts. It's, it's very um, appropriate to have a co-author's perspective on his contributions in the realm of environmental work, and also the convergence uh, with regard to the, the military perspective and environmental hazards and, and NEPA and environmental challenges. So thank you so very much. We uh, are very grateful for those insights. Not surprised uh, as excellence and uh, 
contributions in the field of environmental law and land use are, are Professor Mandelker's hallmarks. So we're not surprised, but happy to, to receive your perspective. Next uh, is Dan Tarlock. Dan? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor from uh, Chicago Kent College of Law. And my contribution to the mosaic of Dan's work uh, is to argue that the most important legacy of his scholarship is its continuing relevance uh, to contemporary land use uh, problems. Uh, and if the editors of uh, Urban, uh, the Urban Lawyer would let me, I would put continuing in bold caps. Uh, to do this, I selected two relatively recent articles. And again, uh, the emphasis on relatively, because during my whole career, I've never been able to keep up with Dan's scholarship. But I selected an article on uh, uh, spot zoning in 2016 and one on standing in 2021. Uh, what I do is to riff on the relevance of these uh, articles uh, to the need for greater uh, urban density to address uh, two related problems. Uh, one, of course, is the housing affordability crisis, which uh, Lee uh, Eisenweiler has uh, talked about. Uh, the other is to adapt to global climate uh, change. And uh, what I basically uh, do is to try to suggest the relevance of those articles uh, to the many controversies and litigation uh, that is going to follow as uh, we end our long love affair with single family zoning. Uh, since uh, Ed Sullivan did a, a visual, I wanna hold up something. Oh uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, this work, no. Um, sorry. This is a picture I took in a Seattle neighborhood and a city that has special meaning to Dan's uh, scholarship. Uh, and uh, I just posed the question, is this bad spot zoning or uh, adaptation to both climate change and housing affordability. Uh, but actually what I wanna do is to uh, use uh, the rest of my time just to read uh, the first paragraph of my comment because it's another illustration uh, of Dan's uh, legacy uh, on those of us who chose to enter uh, uh, academic teaching and uh, to focus on uh, land use controls. Uh, in ninth, and I, uh, I do this in part because I think I do have the honor of knowing Dan the longest of anybody involved in this symposium. Uh, in 1966, I was barely out of law school and teaching my first land use uh, class at the University of Kentucky. In October, my upstreet, upstairs neighbor, uh, also a new professor of uh, architecture and urban planning, asked me uh, if I wanted to join him on a drive from Lexington to Louisville uh, to, uh, to go to an APA uh, chapter meeting. Uh, and uh, he said the guest speaker was uh, somebody named Dan Mandelker from Washington University. I already recognized the name because I had read uh, several of his articles in preparation uh, for the course. Uh, so we drove over uh, to Louisville and after Dan's uh, speech with some trepidation, uh, I went up and introduced myself. And of course he was very gracious and uh, welcoming. And that began a 60, uh, 56 plus year uh, professional uh, and uh, friendship uh, relation. Um, it also led uh, to my tenure. Um, uh, Lexington, Kentucky was in the process of deciding uh, where to locate a second regional shopping center. Lexington had uh, a, a very strong planning department. They had a comprehensive plan. Uh, so with the help of a, th a third year law student, I started to follow uh, the process. The bottom line is uh, at the end uh, of the process, uh, they picked a site that had nothing to do with the comprehensive uh, plan. Uh, now here I just want to take a brief uh, uh, detour and read a footnote uh, because it's a, a tribute to, to Dan's scholarship and also a shout out to uh, a, a dear friend and colleague of mine and a, 
a good friend of Dan's and a great uh, land use scholar and lawyer, uh, the late Fred Bosselman. Um, <clears throat> Dan wrote an article in uh, 1962 called The Control of Competition as a Proper Purpose of Zoning. Uh, in, the, in the late uh, 70s, the Supreme Court applied uh, 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 antitrust law to local governments. And so uh, Fred wrote an article, and this is what he said about the earlier article. He said, the article <clears throat> remained one of the best, uh, remain one of the few attempts to analyze an issue that goes to the philosophical heart of uh, zoning power. Uh, just to finish up, um, in 1968, I moved to Indiana University uh, Bloomington and spent that the summer in an unair conditioned office uh, writing up uh, the case study. Uh, uh, thanks to Dan, the uh, resulting article was published in a journal that he had recently founded at Washington University and became the core of my tenure file. And I'm sure uh, there are many uh, other people who could share a similar story. So uh, thank you, Dan. Yes, indeed, Dan. Many of us can share stories of Professor Mendelker's impact on our scholarship and on our tenure process. As I, as I said, my professional relationship with Professor Mendelker made all the difference. And my land use course always went smoothly, which freed up gray matter to try to figure out <laughs> other, other courses and how to make them go uh, as smoothly. So thank you for, for sharing that perspective on how Professor Mandelker has affected positively the trajectory of your stellar career. It is a wonderful, a wonderful story. And I might add, we have a healthy competition going on with regard to who has known Professor Mandelker the longest. So 66, so that takes us back, all right, I think you're claiming what, 50, uh, 56 years, is that? Yeah. Yes, 56. Okay, so we'll, we're, we're keeping it going. Anyone can top 56. I've got a, a surprise for you. It's probably like a sharpened pencil or something. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. I, Next, beat out, uh, I beat out Ed Sullivan and Dave Cowley's. So I know that. Yes, you did. I, I'm keeping period, So anyway. Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I've got you down, 56. Next, we have Nancy Stroud. Nancy, thank you for joining us. I hope that you're well in Palm Beach County. Thank you for, uh, under suboptimal circumstances, finding a way to, to join us. Well, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. It's a, it's a real privilege to be with this distinguished group of people and to share my, um, my great admiration for Dan. Uh, one of the stories that Dan likes to tell uh, about me is how he contacted me one year when our update to the treatise, uh, the casebook, Planning and Control of Land Development, was due. And I had to tell him that while my chapter was almost complete, uh, we were in the middle of a hurricane. It would take a few more days to finish. <laughs> so as usual, Dan was, um, Dan was a taskmaster, master, and he was making sure that the work was done. But also, as usual, um, he was persistent, but very gracious about, about getting that work done. Um, as we know, Dan is incredibly productive in his writing and his scholarship, and it really is truly inspiring. Uh, and even now, as been mentioned several times, he continues to write and publish after decades of uh, his uh, teaching at the university. Um, Working on the treatise and other writing and teaching, uh, much of which Dan has um, encouraged, has helped me to stay very current on land use uh, law, which is a great benefit in my, in my daily practice. I'm a daily practitioner uh, serving local governments, mostly on land use issues. Um, and that leads me to my major point. Um, Dan's work as a preeminent scholar um, an author has been a huge contribution to the planning field and to those who practice in it. Um, he exemplifies that combination of practicality and broad knowledge that's able to inspire and inform practitioners to a better land use practice 
and really for all what we try to do to build better communities. And I appreciate that from his earliest work to his latest work, he has uh, enabled practitioners like myself to learn uh, various aspects of land use and environmental law and, and put them into practice. And I have to say some of his earliest work was before I even became a lawyer, but was very influential on me. Uh, his work on the comprehensive plan and the importance of the plan and, and consistency has really guided my career in, in Florida, particularly um, from the very start and has had lasting impact, I think, throughout the, the nation. Um, and another example, um, his work with the American Bar Association and the American Planning Association uh, on that massive undertaking to create model state legislation um, I believe has influenced um, planning and planning law and will continue to influence uh, planning and community building uh, in the future. And that's just a, a couple of things that I have um, been uh, very attentive to um, and it's really helped me. I think it was um, Brian who talked about the intersection of scholarship and practicality really defining our, our practice uh, and land use. And um, I think Dan personifies that intersection. Um, and then finally, I just want to, um, on a personal note, just thank Dan for being um, a friend and a mentor all these years. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to call upon him. Um, and, and like uh, Carol, I really felt affirmed by his including me in a lot of, uh, of the work that we've done together and always being so gracious about affirming my work as well. Um, and Dan, I look forward to many more years of, of working with you and being a friend. So thank you so much. Well, Professor Mandelker, your ability to retire is coming into increasingly more question, greater question as each speaker goes by because I'm committed to calling and asking and Nancy is looking forward to continuing to work and so many others. I, I wanna affirm Nancy's comments on the, the extreme depth and breadth of your expertise, not only in land use planning control theory, but in practice and your ability to pave a path and help us to see in the classroom and in the office, how to connect the theory with the practice on the ground is really invaluable and, and sets you apart. And you, you deeply appreciate it for your ability to combine, to combine both in such a, an expert, in such an expert way. Thank you, Nancy, for your, for your comments. Our, our second panel of uh, commentators um, uh, begins with Michael Allen Wolf. Welcome, Michael. Hello, Dan and fellow Dan Mandelker fans. Mm -hmm. I hope to make three points during this short presentation, but uh, first I feel compelled to say that I am honored that I made the cut for Dan's second fest trip. My three points are as follows. One, for many decades, I have admired Dan as a teacher and scholar of land use law. Two, Dan is a generous scholar who graciously allowed me to take over his masterful land use law treatise. And three, it is regrettable that the prevailing attitude of too many professors and deans today is that treatise writing and editing does not count as true legal scholarship. When I began law teaching in the early 1980s, Dan was already one of the giants of land use law. Because I was part of Charles, Charles Haar's circle of influence, my admiration for Dan and his landmark scholarship, particularly the relationships of land use regulation and environmental controls and land use restrictions in affordable housing was as an outsider looking in. One of my best friends, Gordon Hilton, whom I first met when who we met when we were first uh, when we were American Civilization graduate students, was lucky to get to know and work closely with Dan, 
and I was a little jealous. However, I could be more objective about the originality and persuasiveness of Dan's findings and arguments. In law schools, indeed university-wide, there was a strong tendency toward balkanization of subject matter. And once new disciplines are established, soon after the border crossings are set up, making it hard to move from one subject to another. Dan's scholarship ignores those artificial boundaries. Yes, zoning is primarily local law and environmental law is primarily state and federal in nature. Yet these two sets of controls often interact, influence each other in profound ways and contribute in positive and negative ways to the common good. Similarly, to talk about the acute need for affordable housing without including zoning and other land use restrictions in the discussion is fruitless. Thanks to Dan's leadership, today's scholars and practitioners are more comfortable with moving between legal disciplines to the benefit of their clients, students, and society at large. For decades, I recommended Dan's land use law as a valuable one volume treatise for my land use law students. I admired his clarity, his knowledge, and his organizational skills. My students were most appreciative of my recommendation and also will th were thankful when the treatise became part of their Lexus Law student package. When I took over Powell on Real Property in 2000, I became even more appreciative of Dan and his treatise. So much so that several years later, several years ago, I told Nancy Greening, our mutual editor at LexisNexis, Matthew Bender, that if Dan was ever in the market for a co-author, I would be very interested. A few years later, Nancy told me that Dan had inquired about my interest in availability. I jumped at the chance and the Mandelka and Wolf partnership has been productive and at least on my end, very satisfying. While I take the lead role in supplementing and updating the text and citations, Dan remains actively involved, always making helpful suggestions. This is truly a partnership. I believe that Dan's decision to author a treatise enhanced his overall scholarship and teaching. Today and for the last couple of decades, deans and colleagues at higher ranked schools discourage others from taking this path. Enamored as we are with placements in student edited law reviews and the citations they attract. Dan's career is proof that one can do it all and do it well. By choosing to write a treatise, his name and ideas are familiar to many outside the academy, judges and practitioners in particular. Empirical studies that have little to do with the actual formation, practice, and validity of law may wow the new generation of law professors and deans. But as an historian, I predict that this phase shall pass and Dan Melnicker will stand as an icon and model for new generations of law professors. Congratulations, Dan. Congratulations indeed, Professor Mandelker. And I, I have to say, as Michael was speaking, I, I almost gave you too much time because I was nodding in affirmation of your experience. Yes, uh, depth and breadth of knowledge. Yes, always helpful comments. Yes, um, whether you're taking the lead on his casebook or not, he is always there in the trenches with a helpful case, that wonderful database that he maintains. And so I, I just affirm all that you've said, and I'm confident that Ed and, and Nancy and Dwight will agree that your experience with Professor Mandelker on the treatise that you two share is exactly on point with our experience. He is just a fountain of, of knowledge and so graceful in sharing it with, with ease and in a way that um, allows you to, to feel the fullness of the partnership without feeling in any way that you're dead weight. <laughs> and so uh, just such a, um, a wonder, it's just, I think Professor Manilker, I hope that you sense that so many of us have talked about how you have improved the trajectory of our professional careers and lives, our work lives. And, and, and so um, I, I'm so thrilled to hear that others 
have had the same experience that I have in, in terms of a sincere gratitude and how you, without even knowing it, uh, uh, positively impacted careers and professional lives and, and happiness, professional happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Rachel, uh, is, uh, Rachel Alterman. Rachel was traveling and um, was, as many of us have experienced, ex having a travel delay, she's flying. But I just want to pause and ask whether Rachel was able to join us. Uh, if not, then we will uh, move to Michael M. Berger. Welcome, Michael. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I am delighted to be here honoring Dan Mandelker because he played such an important, I might even say pivotal role in my professional life. My major problem with talking about Dan is where to begin. So I guess I should go back to the beginning. Dan and I go back more than 50 years to the mid 1960s when I was a student and research assistant of his at Wash U Law School. So Dan Tarlock, since I studied with Dan in 1965 and 1966, I think I have you beat. I think that pencil is mine. When people ask how I got where I am in the profession, my usual response is dominoes. It was fairly largely accidental and Dan was the first domino to fall. I was minding my business as a hard pressed 2L, checking out the bulletin board at the law school when I saw a note from a professor I didn't know who said he needed a research assistant for a subject I knew little about. At that point, I can't say I knew much about land use or even had a serious interest in it, but the gig sounded interesting to a law student since the professor was working on a law review article and was asking for help with the research. So I pulled the note off the board and went off to meet Dan. It was the best accident I ever had. I spent the next two years working for Dan on articles and also taking his land use class. Taking the class, by the way, was a prerequisite to getting the research job. But I was never sorry he made me take that class. Like I said, dominoes. By the way, one of the nice things about working for Dan, as several others have mentioned, is that he never shied away from sharing credit. If you do the research, you will find an old law review article about redevelopment from 1966 or 67 that Dan wrote, but in which he uh, gave me a footnote credit for contributing to it. By incredible coincidence, I received the other day an email from a former student both mine and Dan's about seven years ago, and a researcher for Dan, who with no knowledge of what I was about to say here, attached two law review articles in which Dan gave her a footnote credit for her assistance. I ended up really enjoying that course in land use. I've told others and I will share with you now that I learned more con law from Dan in that class than I did in my con law class, whereas is still often typical, regular con law professors have little interest in the last clause of the Fifth Amendment. No aspersions on my con law professor, but I simply found the issues more interesting the way they popped up in Dan's land use class and the way he discussed them. I actually, by the way, had a summer associate a number of years ago, not from Wash U, Dan, who was supposed to be helping me on a takings case in the California Supreme Court. As so I tried to explain the case to her and the issues that needed researching, she looked at me with the classic wide-eyed look of a deer in the headlights and explained that her con law professor told the class that he did not intend to waste any time on the takings clause and the students could study it on their own if they liked. Dan gave me the next bump in my career when after passing the Missouri bar, I found that there were virtually no jobs in St. Louis where I had grown up for young lawyers. Next domino, Dan introduced me to another heavyweight in the land use field. George Lefko at the University of Southern California. Turned out that George had an LLM fellowship available that coincidentally paid about as much as a St. Louis law firm was willing to pay a first year associate in those days. When George offered it to me, I immediately got on a plane and headed for Los Angeles and never looked back. Dan and I stayed in touch over the years. We participated in conferences together several times at Wash U at his instigation, I'm pleased to say. And when I eventually became part of the Wash U adjunct faculty, we spent time together when I came back to St. Louis to teach. He always found time to have dinner with my wife and me. But he and I were a strange couple. Dan had early on described himself as a police power hawk, as some of you may know. 
meaning as I understood it from the other side of the fence, that anything the government wanted to do was okay. Although I think he's mellowed somewhat in more recent days. But I was, as I said, on the other side of the fence. I had joined a small firm in Los Angeles that specialized in takings and land use law, only from the property owner's side. As I said, Dan got me started in the field and then the dominoes kept falling. My firm almost never represented the government unless it was to sue some other government agencies. One of my favorite cases, by the way, was representing the city of Inglewood against the city of Los Angeles because of the noise nuisances inflicted by the latter's airport on the former's residence. But Dan and I remained friends anyway. We actually found it possible to jointly co-author a semi-scholarly article on the one subject we found that we could agree on. We both thought that the ripeness rule requiring regulatory takings plaintiffs to sue and lose in state court before they could seek compensation in federal court was, to use the technical term, stupid. Dan felt so strongly about the issue that he even testified before Congress in two successive sessions trying to find a legislative solution to the judicially created morass. I am pleased to say that although we appeared to be a bit ahead of our time, the Supreme Court finally got rid of that abomination, although it took them 35 years to do so. So Dan, it has been an incredible pleasure to know you and work with you for more than half a century. Man, that makes us both sound old. Although we've had some substantive disagreements over the years, the profession will be less interesting place without you. I hope you enjoy your retire. Thank you so much, Michael. And I think your contribution is so important because I think for many, we, we have lost the art of believing that reasonable minds can disagree and that disagreement can result in a rising tide that lifts all boats. And that even with regard to disagreement, there are areas where we can find commonality. I, I so appreciated your, your stories. Uh, your, uh, the, the domino analogy really resonates. And isn't life like that? One, one right step can send us on a, a very rich path. And so thank you for sharing those personal reflections of, of the impact that Professor Mandelker has had on your career. And as you said, on different sides of, of, of issues, but friends and respected colleagues. So uh, what, what a rich and important story. Rahel has been able to land the plane and join us. Rahel, are you, are you on the line? Rahel? Unfortunately not. I'm in a train, on the train from Amsterdam to Groningen, and it's impossible to participate. My plane was late and so was the train. Yes. Apologies. Well, we certainly understand. Why don't, Rahel, uh, I will proceed to the third group of commentators, starting with uh, Frank Schneidman. And before I uh, end, I will pause and see if you're in a better place. And if so, we'll open the floor for you. And if not, we certainly will understand if that's all right. Wonderful. Next, our, our final group of commentators, Frank Schneidman. Well, thank you very much. And again, as, as everybody has expressed, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, participate in this event honoring Dan. Uh, I guess I don't have known Dan as long as Michael or Dan Tarlock. I've only known him 50 years. Uh, Dan and I first met when he was a consultant to a joint legislative committee that I worked for in the New York State Legislature uh, that was trying to update our general municipal law, general uh, our city law, and our town law. And then um, I think the following year I met Dan in New York City. He, I think he was visiting at a a, a law school at that time. And we attended a bar association meeting where I think we both went and listened to this young attorney talk about his uh, brand new case. And the young attorney was Bob Freilich. And the case, of course, was uh, Golden versus the planning board of the town of Ramapo. Now, I have a, a very unique 
experience with Dan, different from anyone else. Because over the years, I have organized and participated in more than 100, well, many more than 100 conferences and seminars. And 24 almost 24 times, I have invited Dan and he has attended. And I'm looking at the draft of the paper that I've written. And Dan, Dan, at my invitation, traveled to Boston, Massachusetts, Boulder, Colorado, Cambridge, Mass, Chicago, Illinois, Coronado, California, Kansas City, Missouri, Miami, Florida, San Diego, San Francisco, Santa Fe, Seattle, Washington, and virtually. He has been all over with me and his participation in these conferences has been amazing. The first time I invited Dan to attend a conference was October 22nd of 1977. And this is the ALIABA uh, brochure. I co-chaired this event with um, Dick Babcock and on the faculty at that time was Arden Rathkoff and Norman Williams, two land use greats of the latter half of the 20th century and friends of Dan. Now, um, in 1979 in Cambridge, I chaired a transferable development rights study group. And this is a picture of the group and there's Dan in the center up on the top. Not only is Dan Tarlock in that picture, but Dick Babcock, Judge Charles Brightell, Andrew uh, DeLogue, uh, Gideon Canner, Don Hagman, Charlie Har, um, and Norman Marcus from New York City. So we have had the opportunity to expose Dan's scholarship, Dan's opinion, to Dan's opinion to so many others. And even when Dick Babcock did the second zoning game book, and we had a seminar at MIT to review the draft of the zoning game revisited before. And this is the group and it includes not only Gideon Canner and George Lefkow and Dick Babcock, Neil Pierce and Dan, of course, you can see him right there in the center, uh, David Brower. And on the right, the man at the end is Larry Beckow, who is now the president of Harvard University. And this was of course, back in 1979. Uh, Excuse me, that was in 84. Over the years, Dan has participated along with Michael Berger and many others. But in, in 2004, I asked Dan to, to give the keynote address at the ALI ABA Land Use Institute. And I have the video of Dan's August 27, 2004, planning and zoning, what is their future? And that will be part of what we post with a digital version of the issue of the urban lawyer. And I don't think Dan has even seen this. Uh, additionally, in uh, 2008, Charlie Hard did a presentation on, in accordance with a comprehensive plan. And we have the, the, the audio and the video. And Dan, of course, was the commentator to Charles's presentation because the two of them lead the scholarship along with Ed Sullivan of the comprehensive plan. And then of course, the last one that I invited Dan to participate in is an October 20th, 2021 program for the ABA on affordable housing. And that was Dan's virtual participation. And as always, his scholarship, his presentation uh, was amazing. Dan has over the years, and I will have in the article, a number of quotes of Dan's that deal with a variety of issues relating to land use. But one of his former students, Annette Colas, who worked for the Urban Land Institute, had asked Dan, myself, and actually um, Robert Einsweiler to participate in a book on perspectives on regulatory simplification. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to tell you that one of the quotes that I will include in my article is one that basically ends with a sentence, regulatory simplification must clearly address the fairness imperative. And Dan talks about the fairness in that uh, article. I had had the opportunity to read, as many of you have, Dan's scholarship over the years. And I recall 
uh, being surprised when I was doing an article, uh, doing some research on uh, land markets in metropolitan Washington, DC with a gentleman named Homer Hoyt, who uh, was a real estate economist. And I asked him uh, for the piece that I was doing, if he could recommend some guidance for me and Dan won't even remember this article. Uh, but from the UCLA Law Review in 1964, Dan published an article called Controlling Land Values in Areas of Rapid Urban Expansion. And I use that article as a basis of an organization for a uh, report on Montgomery County given to me by Homer Hoyt, probably around 1975 and 1976. It is uh, 12 UCLA Law Review 734 back in 1964. Now, Dan, because of, of my previous involvement with uh, neighborhood legal services and landlord tenant, my involvement in the Model Cities program in Rochester, New York, I ran across Dan's um, experience, shall we say, with the Federal Housing Agency before we had HUD. And for about eight years, I said to Dan, you need to write an article about your experience with the Federal Housing Administration and how that relates to current urban renewal. And I still have that email that Dan wrote me on December 4th, 2008, because he said, here, Frank, finally, is the URL for my article just published on my early days with urban renewal in the Federal Housing Agency in our online journal. You may reproduce it for conferences. And when, and this is 2008 from then on, because of course the 2005 Kelo decision, every time I had a conference and we discussed the Kelo case, Dan's article was included in Dan's historical perspective, which nobody else has ever provided in such detail, um, was again, as everyone who preceded me has said, his scholarship has educated so many. Now, in closing, let me say that um, in, in years and years ago, I did a book called Handling the Land Use Case. It's now in its third edition, but the second edition, the preface was done by, the forward was done by Dan Mandelker. And Dan has promised me that next year, when the fourth edition, which is now 1600 pages in two volumes, Dan will also give me the honor of doing the forward. So, as I say in the end of my article, Dan has always been a motivational speaker, passionate about his subject matter. And if you don't believe that, you never attended a panel of my conferences where Dan and Bob Freilich and Gideon Canner were all on the same program because there was passion. Now, Dan's depth of knowledge and his historical perspective is unmatched among our peers. And I have to tell you, Dan, that there are hundreds of lawyers over the years who have attended all of the programs that I've asked you to speak on, who have benefited not only from the written materials you provided, but the clarity with which you challenged other speakers in sometimes a polite and sometimes not so polite way. And we all remember those. And I say, Dan's continued friendship and agreement to participate in so many of my conferences and seminars are something that I will forever be grateful. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Frank, for those wonderful insights. We all have benefited and I think are impressed with your impeccable record keeping and documentation. Um, we should all aspire to be as well organized and able to, to call upon wonderful historical memories. And I'm confident that the Urban Lawyer will be very happy to receive some of those, those rare uh, records and footages that you indicated that you'd be willing to post with the Urban Lawyer. Thank you. Well, we are moving on to our third panel and, and final panel of commentators. Uh, 
Frank uh, led us off and we are now with uh, Peter Buxbaum. Hi, um, good to join you here. Our, our phone started ringing here at the house. I gotta... Okay, my wife didn't get it, so it's not gotten. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, best trip honoring Dan. Uh, I can't tell how long it was that we first met, but I know it wasn't 56 years. Um, more like a mere 25 or 30. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure and an inspiration to uh, have worked with Dan, uh, interacted with Dan over these, over these, uh, over these many years. Um, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, take off on what uh, John Baker said. I'm gonna briefly talk about the six faces of Dan. Um, one, hatred of snobbery. I was at one conference where somebody said something like, I'm Joe Jones from Harvard and I say that, and Dan immediately responded, I'm, I'm Dan Manlooker from Washington U in St. Louis and I don't give a damn about what you said. It, it, maybe it wasn't quite as strong, but it was, it was close. Uh, the, the idea got across. He was no respecter of persons, he was a respecter of ideas. Um, second, his intensity. I, uh, as a trial judge, and talk about a cat in a hot tin roof, I decided a, a, a sign case involving an electric sign on an interstate in New Jersey. And I decided in favor of the sign, the appellate division in its wisdom reversed and the case went up to the Supreme Court. And I kept on getting calls from Dan like every other month. When are they coming down with this decision? When are they coming down with this decision? Like I'm a trial judge. I have no control over these guys and, and ladies. They'll come down when they're ready to come down. So eventually they did come down. They decided in favor of the sign and I not only got to satisfy Dan, but there's no greater reward for a trial judge than being reversed by the appellate court at the intermediate court and then being sustained by the highest court. So it was a, but it was wonderful the way Dan just kept saying, they, they gotta come down with this decision. I need it for my book. Um, third face of Dan, his generosity, which has been, which has been mentioned both with his time and, and uh, in other ways. We worked together on a study of, uh, regulatory coordination back around 2005. And uh, it was done, funded by the Lincoln Institute. And Dan put a lot of work into the study, but at the end of the day, he said, you know, I really didn't do enough work to have my name on the study. And uh, I'd be happy if you don't put it on. Now, that was very generous because he certainly merited, his work merited a place in the study, but, but he felt and he, this is his generosity. He felt that um, his contribution was not such that, that he could um, honestly have his name put on the paper. And it did eventually appear in the, uh, in the, in the urban lawyer. Um, but that's an example of generosity. Um, Michael Berger or, or no, Frank Schnidman just mentioned uh, some of the intensity at some of the conferences and uh, that's another characteristic of uh, Dan's is, is the intolerance of chatter. Um, he talked about Freilich and some of the others and the, smart, the uh, histrionics that might go on. Well, at this one conference in Denver, Freilich said something and I don't remember what it was and I'm sitting next to Dan and first there's a muttering and then all of a sudden from the back row of the, of the, uh, of the auditorium, there's an explosion. That's absolutely nuts, Dan gets up and says, and of course I was sitting next to it and got almost, uh, I had some hair then, it got singed. Um, but it was quite, it was an unforgettable experience both as to Dan's uh, intensity and his, and his uh, integrity really. Um, and it, what's interesting to uh, read something by Freilich recently, praising Dan to the skies. And so it wasn't a personal matter at all. It was purely an intellectual disagreement and yet he had that kind of passion about it. Um, a fifth face of Dan is his openness to ideas. Uh, he asked me to comment on this magisterial article he wrote fairly recently, or I guess 2021, the article about standing. And I uh, came up with a bunch of thoughts. Uh, standing in New Jersey is a very peculiar animal. Basically, uh, you don't need much to have it. If you live in the next town, it seems to be enough. So I kept on writing this stuff in that New Jersey doesn't fit the pattern. And, and he was very receptive to the fact that uh, our state might be aberrant 
and that the, some of the general conclusions that he was drawing in the article um, about the use of standing as a as a litigation device might might have some uh, exceptions in at least some of the states. The last thing I want to mention, and um, Michael Berger touched on this, his his courage, his academic courage. Uh, in 2001, we had a famous or infamous takings retreat at which uh, Dan and I and a few others came to the conclusion that uh, Williamson County was nuts and that it should be that it was, from my perspective as a one-time civil rights lawyer, denying any group the uh, right to be in federal court was, was simply wrong. And Dan, although Dan had this overwhelming reputation as a police power hawk, and he had to go against people who, with whom he related and people who were his uh, intellectual, uh, part of his intellectual fraternity. Nonetheless, he didn't hesitate in doing that. He stepped right up and said, and helped author uh, a report which said, Williamson County is nuts. And I remember we went to the IMLA conference that year, International Municipal Law Association, and they were supposed to vote on, on, on the paper we had sent. And we found out that before Dan and I could speak, they already voted us down. Um, but he can, he, as you can see, as, as Michael mentioned, he continued to push on the issue. And eventually uh, uh, with, with the Nick decision, um, it took 30, may have taken 35 years, but uh, Dan, Dan's uh, intellectual courage and honesty was, uh, was rewarded by the Supreme Court. And in that connection, I'd mentioned my last activity with Dan, which involved two of the other panelists, Frank uh, Schnidman and Michael Wolf. Again, uh, Dan being a, a supposedly a municipal um, advocate, still co-authored with the three of us a manifesto that there needed to be more affordable housing, that not only from a regulatory standpoint, but from a budget standpoint, the federal government had to step up uh, and start doing something more. There had to be a revival of the old, some kind of revival of the old federal housing programs. And that I think from Dan's normal perspective as a police power walk and a municipal advocate took, I mean, I, you know, I accepted it as a matter of fact from Dan by then. But it also when you, when you think of it, um, it took some courage to say, you know, the, the municipalities in effect had to accept more of this, of this kind of housing because there was a problem in America that needed to be addressed. So what a package, you know, hatred of snobbery, intensity, generosity, intolerance of uh, chatter, openness to ideas and sheer intellectual courage. And I've gotten so much out of my relationship with, uh, with Dan that uh, I, I, I'm glad I was able to cover it in something like five minutes, but um, I, I really appreciate it, Dan, having you as a friend and as a mentor and as a colleague. Thank you so much, Peter. As it strikes me, really, the comments of the other speakers and commentators seem perfectly subsumed within your six uh, characteristics or qualities and observations. And so you've really done a nice job of capturing and, and, and expressing the major themes that have presented themselves with regard to Professor Mandelker, his scholarship, his service, and his impact on the profession. It was a pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Dwight, Miriam. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, hello, Carol and Dan, um, the participants who are joining us today, and um, the speakers, as well as the school leadership. We appreciate all the work that you've done to make this possible. I guess I have to start by, out by asking, have you read Dan Menuker's curriculum vitae? The most recent summary is 17 single space pages at 12 pitch font. And I say summary because the CV does not list all his work. The list of articles labeled partial spans five pages. I count 27 books. Then there's a list of chapters in books. 
and monographs, and then seven monographs that he exclusively wrote, and so much more. I know of no one, and I challenge anyone that's with us today to say otherwise, with a greater body of work and contributions to land use law. But what I learned from Dad that has shaped my life as a land use lawyer cannot be found anywhere in his CV. What I learned from Dad is how important it is for every one of us to mentor to others, to reach out and initiate contact, and to actively seek and give counsel and support. He did that for me around the time I graduated from law school and had published an article on transferable development rights. He was 20 years my senior and I had not had any other contact with him, but he reached out to me and he became my mentor for these nearly 50 years since. Dan has done that the same with so many others. I learned from him that it is our obligation to be mentors, that we must recognize that others want and need and will benefit by our guidance, that we further our collective intellectual and practice development by being mentors, that mentoring is not a zero sum game. We lose nothing and we gain much when we mentor others. That an important part of our legacy will be found in the hearts and the minds of those we serve as mentors. And that fundamentally mentoring is catalytic. It makes things happen that otherwise would not. Professor Nicholas Epley of the University of Chicago and his team have done years of research on the tendency of people to be antisocial, to believe that others do not want to interact. But they found that people do want to engage with others far more than we imagine. None of us should be reluctant to reach out and offer ourselves as mentors. Dan did that for me. The term today encompassing, encompassing mentoring and, and more uh, is pay it forward. The concept is found in ancient Greek comedies. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson in his 1941 essay, Compensations uh, offers this quote, in the order of nature, we cannot render benefits to those from whom we receive them or only seldom, but the benefit we receive must be rendered again, line for line, deed for deed, cent for cent to somebody. Lily Hardy first used the phrase in her 1916 novel, Garden of Delight, when she wrote, quote, you don't pay love back, you pay it forward. Dan couldn't repay his mentors and teachers and all who helped him, but he paid it forward with me and with so many others. I can't repay Dan for all that he has done for me, but I can pay it forward. That's what I learned from Dan. And that's what has enriched my life in a way no one else has. We honor Dan when we follow his example. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Dwight. Dwight, praise from you is high praise indeed. I view you as one of the most prolific litigators, practitioners, scholars that there are. And for you to acknowledge Professor Mendelfer's body of work is high praise. And Professor Mendelfer, I, I think you should, you should feel comfortable and confident that the mentoring that you gave Dwight, he's been a good steward of, and he has paid it forward. And I, I personally am a recipient of that. So to be mentored by you, and then for you to, in a way, hand me off in some way to, to Dwight, I am fortunate and my career has, has benefited from it. And, and it is, I think it is lovely for Dwight to make that connection, that it's a circle really, that he has been a good steward of your mentorship. And so your mentorship just continues in the next generation. And Dwight has been a great steward of that. And I'm 
have um, appreciate you for what you've done for Dwight. And I've told Dwight on, on many occasions, I so am deeply grateful to him for what he's done for me. And I now see that part of the impetus is his stewardship of the incredible mentoring that you provided to him. And that is uh, just, it's just incredible. So thank you, thank you, uh, Dwight. Our final commentator, and I, I almost hate to say this, so maybe I should just speak slowly so that this time together could just move on and on, is Patricia Salkin. Thank so, you. Thanks, Carol, and, and thank you, Dan, for inviting me to participate in today's uh, Fetch Rift. I'm in the unenviable position of going last and none of us having coordinated our remarks. And so I'm going to edit a little bit as I go along. There are many themes that uh, overlap, but I think that I have some things to, to add that have not yet been said and important. Um, Dan, uh, 66 years in, in the land use and planning field is remarkable and something that all of us are envious of and hope that we too can reach uh, that milestone. Um, I think that you are the most published law professor on not just um, narrow topics in planning and zoning, but on a wide variety of topics of planning, zoning, and environmental law. Most of us spend our careers um, learning as best we can one, two, three um, narrow or specific topics and get known for that. But you are the giant in the field because you have somehow been able to um, develop a mastery of the subject matter for everything. I think that we first met at one of Frank Stidman's uh, ALI ADA Land Use Institute programs. And I immediately knew that you were the giant in the field from the revere and the respect that I saw that people uh, had for you. And I saw how attendees listened carefully to everything that you had to say. And so I quickly took copious notes and learned that as part of my career, in order to be successful, I had to follow you around. Our paths also crossed at the ADA state and local government law section meetings and your contributions uh, to, to the ADA and also at the American Planning Association and the American Association of Law Schools. And so when I think about the list that Frank rattled off of all of the cities and places that you were at his annual program, and then I think about all of the places that those of us on this uh, call have said, we saw you at, or we interacted with you at, um, or were on a panel with you at. Um, I don't know how you were in all of these places in any given year, um, it, it's just remarkable. A sampling of words that uh, describe you to me, and some of them overlap clearly with words that we have uh, heard this afternoon. Smart, principled, passionate, generous, kind, mentor, and a friend. I too uh, looked at your uh, resume uh, like I knew that Dwight probably would. And to me, I look at the practical effect that your uh, work has had. I looked at the speeches and testimony that you gave before Congress, the Presidential Commission, the U.S. Council on Environmental Quality, White House working groups, a number of state and local governments, the work that you have contributed to IMLA, the Institute for Local Government Studies at the Center for American and International Law, the National Association of Environmental Professionals, the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, the Urban Land Institute, the Rocky Mountain Land Institute, the Transportation Research Board, and dozens of more. It's not just the people who were your formal students and the people who were your known colleagues and collaborators like everybody on this call, but I think that you have really, through all of this work, through all of the speeches that you gave, the insights that you shared all across the United States, nobody has had a more profound impact on the way that people think about planning, think about the environment and environmental regulation, and think about land use law than the impact that you have made 
because there's tens of thousands of people that you have spoken before and probably more that have read your work and used your work and people that you have no idea who they are in communities that you have no idea who they are and the students that you've educated and the work that they have done in those communities. Um, really, when you sit to think about it, it, the impact has been profound and has been positive. You've also been an expert witness and a consultant on many uh, litigated cases. While I too looked at all of the books and the articles and the monographs that Dwight did, I took it a step further and I plugged your name into Westlaw for a case law search. And uh, not just the, the Supreme Court cases that uh, Robert mentioned, but I found your work cited in six Federal Circuit Court of Appeals cases, the second, fourth, fifth, seventh, ninth, and 10th, and in 10 state high courts, plus the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Wisconsin uh, Supreme Court has cited you multiple times, as has Montana. Um, you've been in West Virginia, Florida, Maryland, Illinois, Hawaii, Washington, North Carolina, and Louisiana, and then many appellate courts decisions um, in those and other states. There have been a number of published uh, reviews of some of your uh, works and some of the books, and I don't know if you remember all of them, but I wanted to just point out to everybody some of the things that people have said about your work. Um, Doug Kamek uh, mentioned in, in one of his uh, pieces that some people worry that Professor Mandelker's advocacy may result in unintended consequences. And I'll talk more about that. UC Davis Law Professor Daniel Fessler reviewed your 1971 book titled The Zoning Dilemma, where he writes about Dan, quote, as a student of urban growth politics and the multifaceted economics of private land use decision making, he finds in the ambitious rhetoric of the comprehensive plan, a promise that exceeds the goal defining and development directing capacities of the municipal sovereign. Among the many themes in the book, Professor Mandelker, while embracing zoning regulation, is worried about its impact and discrimination against the economically disadvantaged. This is back in 1971. You were rolling against the tide then, as you still are now, and that's what makes you make a difference in challenging everybody to see right and wrong. Professor Fessler uh, points out the overriding preference for the single family dwelling unit and the tendency to concentrate and segregate high intensive uses from the environs intended for the advantage threatens to imprison the urban poor. He's quoting uh, something that Dan wrote. Professor Tarlock, who's on this call, also reviewed this book in 1972 and began, quote, for many years, Professor Mandlicker has ranked among the most energetic scholars serving the law in action tradition of the University of Wisconsin. He described how Dan set out to provide an empirical study to determine primarily on a formal record whether zoning agency decisions were consistent with a comprehensive plan. And back in that 1972 book and the research was going on before that, he used the computer program to help aid in the research and analysis. And Dan's use of technology is something that I wanna come back to because Dan, you were ahead of your time and you've used it effectively to uh, help us understand things earlier and also uh, to help educate the public on a regular go forward basis. Brooklyn Law Professor Bailey Conklin reviewed Dan's 1981 book, Environmental Equity, a Regulatory Challenge, summing up the message that quote, environment and equity are indeed regulatory challenges. They are fraught with unresolved conflicts, which, undoubt, which, which doubtlessly get worse. We must go on with solving them. And this is a theme that Dan has dedicated a good portion of his career to, to solving problems, to ensuring equity, both for the environment and for uh, humanity. Douglas Kamek also reviewed this book, noting that Professor Mandricard uh, departs from other environmental advocates at the time 
by stating his interest in the environment as a subjective value preference that should be accorded absolute protection against other interests in energy, housing, industrial productivity, and environment. He notes the central thesis that, quote, environmental values are subjective and incapable of objective proof. I also read uh, Lieutenant Daniel Rosenberg's published uh, review in the 1989 Naval Law Review of your uh, 1984 NEPA law and litigation book, but I think Robert Glixman uh, covered that appropriately in this call. And then lastly on the book reviews in 2010, Dwight Miriam reviewed Designing Planned Communities and noted that Dan began this work because he was troubled by hostile court decisions holding that standards for planned communities were unconstitutionally vague Yet he finds through court decisions of support for comprehensive plans that can enunciate conceptual design indicators without having to articulate specific and too narrow design standards for planned communities. Dean Osgood, if you're still on, I, I wanted to uh, remind everybody of a 1998 interview that was published in Planning. It was an interview of staff uh, to Dan or of Dan Mandelker. And the final question in that interview was 1998, do you have thoughts on retirement? And Dan responded, never. And Dan, I hope that that never is still true because we need to still benefit from your intellect, from your insights. And one of the things, one of the themes that, that somebody talked about, I think Michael Berger brought it up, you know, I think over time, in all the conversation and in the dialogue, all of us have moved positions um, and moved analysis in different ways. And somehow uh, most of us, I think if not all of us on this call, even though we may have started you know, at one point on different ends of the spectrum, um, many of us have inched much closer together. And I think that uh, a lot of that has been through your leadership. The American Planning Association also asked you if you could change one thing about planning law in the United States, what would it be? And you responded, I would make planning mandatory and I would require zoning to be consistent with the plan. And again, this goes back to Ed Sullivan's comments and about um, you really being uh, a, a leader and an early voice in making sure that communities just didn't go crazy with the power to uh, enact zoning and land use regulations, but that people thought carefully about the consequences of their decisions and did it um, with some rationality. And that rationality and engagement of the, the community is through the comprehensive plan. And Dan, I think that um, better than any of us, you have made sure that a fair amount of your work is always available and readily accessible to the public. You were an early adopter of the idea of developing a website that you wanted everybody to access, not just your students. Um, you've only put a select amount of your work on SSRN. I think if you put all of it on, it would probably blow up SSRN. But with about 19 articles listed, you have over 1,400 downloads, which is really uh, incredible. And I think at the end of the day, if I were to, to sum it all up, um, I'm jealous because I didn't go to your law school and I was not a student uh, in your land use law course like many of the people on this call. But I know from my interactions with you more recently that uh, true to what everybody has said you did for them, you and I have interacted because you have brought students to the floor who wrote good papers in your class and you wanted to push them to be better and you wanted them to get published as law students. And so we've worked together um, to publish some of your students' work in the Zoning and Planning Law Report. And uh, I appreciate being a partner with you to enable the next generation to have the same kind of excitement and to whet their appetite in seeing um, at a young age that they could actually get something published and that people will read it because that's kind of the psychic reward and the psychic value for wanting to do more. And I want to end by thanking you for uh, always being a role model and a mentor and always answering my emails and always answering my phone calls. Dan, you're a true mensch.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, for, for your remarks. You really summarized the sentiments, I think, that ran throughout the, the, the best shift. Well, I'm your only foreign participant in this fest shift, but I am the proof that Dan's wings, his academic wings, his intellectual leadership goes all the way beyond the Atlantic and beyond the Mediterranean, all the way to tiny Israel. And the story of my first meeting with Dan's work goes back to about 1973 or four. My research topic uh, at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in the then just forming uh, planning school, I was doing my PhD uh, there after having um, gotten all my other schooling in Winnipeg, Canada. So you could say, well, maybe I represent the missing Canadians here uh, too, to some extent. Well, my topic was implementation of what would be the equivalent of zoning plans in the US. Um, and I developed a method of trying to measure that. I wasn't, I didn't have a law degrees yet, but my supervisor, the late uh, Professor Morris Hill or Moshe Hill, he was a little bit doubtful about what's this thing about looking at how further decisions uh, abide by or change, amend uh, the initial plan or what you would call zoning. Um, what's that and measuring that? And then one day in our library, small library of the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning, somebody, I haven't found out who, had ordered the zoning dilemma. In the zoning dilemma, I found the first research ever published, I think, that actually counted the amendments to zoning had some measures, some measurement over there, and, and, uh, and, and brought the intellectual, the questions to ask about the relationship between the norms that zoning or regulatory planning makes and the decisions later. So I wrote him a letter. Can you imagine the snail mail of the time? Snail mail wasn't called snail mail, snail mail, just air mail. And then after about two weeks, I got a supportive letter from Professor Dan Mandelker. And that letter and then further communication through snail mail uh, really got us together to be, uh, to, for me to be able to enjoy uh, Dan's intellectual coverage, you would say. We met only six years later at one of the ACSP, uh, one of the first ACSP conferences, the Association of Collegiate Schools uh, of Planning, but our relationship has continued. I should also be directly, thank, directly thankful to Dan's uh, leadership uh, when uh, he, um, asked me, I was in Israel then, he asked me whether I'm interested in doing a symposium issue of the Washington Global Studies Law Review. And I was just about, we were just about to go for my sabbatical at that time in, in at the University of Miami. And I said, okay. And he said, do you have a topic? And I said, well, I've just been writing something criticizing the Israeli equivalent to your regular, regulatory takings. I won't take, uh, tell you about it. And I'd started to do some international inquisitive uh, research. My research for the past 30, 40 years has all been international comparative. But then Dan said, well, would you like to do a symposium issue about that? So I said to Dan, symposium? Who is going to pay for the airfare of all the participants from all the countries? I do comparative research. This is going to be 10, 12, 15 countries. He said, no, symposium just means you people, 
in every other academia in the world, I think symposium is just a special issue. So now I know. And that became my uh, book, Takings International, one of my comparative books, but I think perhaps the most important one. Let me also say something about uh, the group here uh, that is honoring uh, Dan. I know many of you personally, maybe some through Dan, I was also in the previous first trip, maybe through my, um, my comparative research, my sabbaticals in the USA, the names that I'd known already from, from Canada, I've known, I've met most of you in person, but you should all know that the uh, level of academic research into, may I use the international term planning law, which you would call zoning and other regulatory planning uh, tools, you are unbelievably leading globally because maybe because you have to, because everything you touch, or almost every uh, regulatory uh, tool has to meet the constitution almost face to face, your national constitution. That is not the situation in most countries. So that has brought a very important uh, intellectual leadership. For example, Dan's, I think it's a chapter about um, the comprehensive plan as a constitution. I use that a lot, the depth of thinking that Dan is a leader in, but many of you have done just as well. And if you had all the years that Dan has had, you will be doing um, a, a similar kind of work and you have been doing. So I'm really, um, I feel it a privilege, a privilege to be one of Dan's, um, perhaps I would say students, one of his mentorees, and a member of your uh, group. Uh, may I just add with a tiny bit of criticism, you're very good, you're very challenged. American planning, zoning, regulatory takings, better exactions law is extremely sophisticated, but that is not the world. And it's very important to get out of this bathtub, it's huge, but get out of it occasionally so that at least there is some uh, level playing field in the terminology. So let's go on with these exchanges with Dan as our leader. Uh, since COVID, Dan and I have uh, developed a kind of um, instant tradition of meeting every two months over Zoom and exchanging uh, cross-national thinking, uh, I tell them about what my PhD students are doing, what uh, the faculty members that I'm dealing with promotion, he gives advice, and there is nobody like Dan. Dan, you are golden man, Delker. Thank you. Dan's book is on my shelf, you will see. It's not artificially on my shelf. It's one of his treatises. And I go back to it from time to time in order to uh, delve into the well of knowledge and understand American zoning, planning, and related uh, land regulation uh, and its deep intricacies and challenges. Thank you. Professor Mandelker, if we were in person, we would stand we would extend a warm applause as we welcome you to the podium for your remarks. But in this virtual environment, I trust that you sense our enthusiasm and our anticipation for your closing thoughts. And I hope that you sense the love and the well wishes, the regard and the respect that flows from us to you. I very much do. And I wish I could say something to each one of you. And I realize as I listen today that each of you in one way or the other has been a very important part of my life, either as a collaborator or as a co-author or as someone who helps me publish, uh, as someone who helps me in some of the consulting and litigation work I have done. I couldn't have done any of that 
without all of you. And that's the lesson. That's the lesson I've learned from today. That's that's one of the lessons I've learned from today. I want to thank all of you for what you've done. Uh, this festive has given me memories I so long cherish. I don't know how to express my gratitude. Many thanks also to all who worked so hard to make this happen. And to all of you, I shall always remember what all of you have done for me today. It was a great send off and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Mandelker. Feel confident that we are not far away and that we are excited as you enter uh, phase two and the next great adventure. And please continue to accept our emails and phone calls. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating.